It is great to uh, see everybody. Great to be at family camp. Uh, I'm excited about uh, the theme this year. Um, as Mr. Luke Wilson talked about last night, just the messages uh, to this point have been uh, awesome, really encouraging. And I really appreciate just the overall theme and the thought process through that theme of uh, the Old Testament uh, being the New Testament concealed, the New Testament being the Old Testament uh, revealed. And I wanted to start out this evening talking about something that has, has been underlining in uh, almost all, I would say, in all of the messages. And, and I probably don't need to say it, but I do feel compelled to, to some degree, um, the fact that this is what is required of good Bible interpretation. You have to go from what is revealed in the New Testament and work your way backwards to what is concealed in the Old Testament to make sure that you have good Bible interpretation. And the guys have all brought that out in different ways. But I want us to understand that that's how you properly understand the Scripture, because as one of the other guys said, that the Holy Spirit's inspired commentary on the Scripture is going to be the correct commentary. The New Testament is going to reveal to us very clearly what the Old Testament is concealing. And so there's so many nuggets and so many good things that we can pull out of the Old Testament. But to make sure and to know that those are correct, we need the revelation of the New Testament. And that's flowing through all the way, but I think that it's good for us to continue as we do our own study and research and as we work with people, have to understand that we get our definitions and we get our concepts from the New Testament and then work our way backwards and to see those in foreshadowings, to see those in pictures and types uh, in the Old Testament. So um, really uh, appreciate the way that that has been brought out uh, throughout uh, the weekend so far. I got an opportunity uh, this summer uh, to go to Altoona, Pennsylvania. And in Altoona, Pennsylvania, I had an opportunity to ride a roller coaster. Now, those of you who know me, this is no shock. I am a little bit of a roller coaster enthusiast, um, and I won't shy away from it. I'll talk your ears off about roller coasters if you're somewhat interested. And I try not to if you're not interested. I don't want to be that guy. But I got to ride a very unique um, roller coaster uh, called Leap the Dips. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about Leap the Dips. Leap the Dips is the oldest operating roller coaster in the world. It's in Altoona, Pennsylvania at a park that looks much more like your local home park where there are basketball hoops, there were literally basketball hoops, um, and tennis courts as opposed to any sort of amusement or theme park. There's just two random roller coasters beside a AAA baseball field. And Leap the Dips, as I mentioned, the world's oldest operating roller coaster, it uh, was constructed in 1902. <laughs> and so it has some unique features. We'll share a couple of those with you. Um, for one, it doesn't have any what's called upstop wheels. And so if you know what that means, there's no wheel on the bottom that's connecting the roller coaster cart or car to the rest of the track. <clears throat> it's what's called a side friction roller coaster which is a nice way to put you're rattling around the whole time, not just you, but the entire car. And so this roller coaster, from a statistical perspective, is mild. It's only 40 feet high. It only goes between 10 to 15 miles per hour. The biggest drop is five whole feet. 
But this roller coaster is terrifying. <laughs> I've ridden roller, this roller coaster is terrifying. For one, the ride operator pushes you <laughs> to get to the lift hill. There's one car. They're like pew seats. There can be up to four people in this car. So the ride operator pushes you to get up the lift hill, and you're like, you know, 40 feet looks a whole lot higher from this perspective. And it's been a long time since this thing has had a paint job. Like, your life is in your hands. Oh, did I mention there are no restraints? <laughs> so a lot of these places, you know, they'll just have buzz bars. You know, those are the roller coaster enthusiasts really like that, right? If you only have a buzz bar. Oh, there's no buzz bar or seatbelt. You're just sitting there, right? And it's like, this is a whole lot more intimidating than like I-305 or Furry 325 or Millennium Force. Like, this is where the, you know, are you really an enthusiast or not? But of course I am, right? So, you know, another unique feature uh, about this ride is, you know, there's a, if you ride in the front, it's a little bit more mild. And I went with actually uh, Tony and uh, Logan, a couple of the guys from the congregation locally, and uh, me and Tony rode in the front, and um, when we rode in the back, we, yeah, I was dumb enough to ride it twice, um, <laughs> but when we, when we rode in the back, um, we, we lifted the, the five-foot drop, was so intense that Tony's glasses went flying, Right? And so we had been at Hershey Park the day before. His glasses were fine, right? We had rode coasters over 200 feet high, no problem with his glasses. We rode Leap the Dips, and his glasses were out of there, right? <laughs> Funny thing was is the, uh, the actual structure, the, his glasses landed on the structure. They didn't even go to the ground. Um, it took the ride operator like 20 minutes to find his glasses, um, one other unique feature about this is that one ride operator, um, yeah, he's also the brake man. It doesn't have brakes. <laughs> he's literally pulling the brakes for you to come to a stop. And I'll tell you what, it was an experience. Um, I didn't know that you could hit your spine that hard and still live. You can, and um, the back is more intense. So if you make it to Altoona, now you know. But the fact that this roller coaster was, was designed and then created in 1902 was, was certainly unique. And it brought a fear factor because, like, clearly this thing was not being designed via computer, right? It's like... Some Joe on the job one day, you hope he did it well. Now, it's been standing since 1902, but it's standing until it's not, right? Like, there's an accident, and there, there's no accident until there is one. All those things go through your head. Hopefully, this will connect later. But I want to talk about God's work with man throughout history. Specifically, I want to talk about how God has left his fingerprint on history for all of us to be able to know and to understand that he is the author of history and that the author of the scriptures. And that the hand of God at work through history uh, was the hand of God at work in bringing about the Jewish people. The hand, at, the hand of God at work in history uh, was at work in bringing about Christianity uh, and ultimately eliminating the difference between Jew and Gentile. And the hand of God is at work today in calling those who are truth seekers. And so I want to kind of bring to light some of the things having to do with God's plan through history in 
uh, bringing about the destruction of the Jewish people, how God's plan all along was to bring the Gentiles in, and that we can see who God really is and His grand design, that this, when you take a look at the Scriptures honestly and objectively, you can only come to the conclusion that the author of history is the author of the Scriptures. And so, uh, as the New Testament reveals very clearly, and as Jesus stated during His time on earth, God's plan was for the whole world, not just for the descendants of Isaac. Now, a lot of the work has been done already about the promise with Abraham was the Christian covenant, right? That was the promise uh, with Abraham or the promises to Abraham. And as God is making covenant with Abraham, ultimately, um, that is the Christian covenant and the law is added because of transgressions. And you can see, as has been brought out oftentimes, you can see passages like Genesis 12, 3, right? In you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Uh, as Mr. Wilson was pointing out uh, this morning, the church in prophecy is all throughout the Old Testament. It's just that there are certain so-called Christian religious circles that want to ignore that because of their fidelity to things like premillennialism. And so we see the plan of God in the Old Testament. And uh, we see that even throughout the Old Testament, that God's plan is that people are saved by their faith. They're not saved. Nobody's saved by keeping the law. They're saved by faith. But as we know, uh, in Jesus's time, you know, the Jews were like, hey, we're the bee's knees, right? We're the only show in town. Uh, and God cares uh, about us and the rest of you people, well, you know, God doesn't care, so nanner, nanner, poo, poo, right? I mean, that's basically, basically what it comes down to. And yet, that's not what the Old Testament prophecy is communicating. They just didn't see it, right? They didn't have the revealed part of that. Now, if they were looking, there are going to be some things that, wait a second, but let's start out by actually looking at some of Jesus' own words. Let's go to John chapter 3. Again, I, I really don't need to go here. Why don't you go to Matthew? Because you, you don't need to go to John 3. Uh, you know, for God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but should have eternal life. How about that whoever? Those are in your red letters, right? Gold, you know, some people call it the golden verse of the scriptures, John 3, 16. But put yourself in the Jewish shoes in that day. Whoever? Uh, excuse me, Jesus, don't you mean whatever Jew? Right? You don't really mean whoever, right? I mean, it's interesting that his enemies oftentimes listened a whole lot closer than his friends did. Right? Matthew chapter 13. See, think that they probably would have put Jesus to death a whole lot sooner had they totally comprehended what he was saying. Matthew chapter 13. Verse 36 here. Matthew 13, 36. Then he left the multitudes and went into the house and his disciples came to him saying... Explain to us the, the parable of the tares and the field. He answered and said, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, and those are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Therefore, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire in that place. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun, in the kingdom of their father, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. The field is the what? World. Jesus, don't you mean the Jews? 
fills the world? He must have misspoke, right? I mean, are they hearing him? Now, this is ultimately part of what gets Jesus crucified, right? Because some of the people did hear him. But the field is the world. He's making these statements about the whole world. And he's even making statements specifically about the Jewish system, isn't he? All throughout his ministry. And particularly about Jerusalem. And so Jesus, living uh, you know, with, with his physical manifestation on the earth, okay, Jesus uh, has not yet ushered in the new covenant. We know that that's going to start in Acts chapter 2. Okay? And Jesus is making these prophecies. This is what's going to take place. And so let's take a look at a couple of those specifically about Jerusalem, specifically about the Jews. Go to Matthew 22. Matthew 22, starting in verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatted livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast." But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged and sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who are invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. Jesus is telling a thinly veiled parable here. He sent out the prophets to uh, the Jewish people. And what happened? Well, it's been well established, right? What did they do to the prophets? Murdered them, right? And, and Jesus is saying here, look, we're not going to just look past that. We're not going to pretend like that didn't happen. Because the king is enraged. And there's going to be some justice doled out to those murderers, and we're going to set their city on fire. See, the Lord is, has a design. The Lord has a plan. The Lord was not caught off guard by the Jewish rejection of Jesus. The Jews had a choice, didn't they? But it was part of of the plan all along so that they could go therefore into the main highways and as many as you find there invite to the wedding feast whosoever will come for God so loved the world the field is the world and so Jesus is communicating that there is going to be a righteous and wrathful judgment upon the city of Jerusalem we can see that in more plain text, just a chapter or two over here in Matthew 24. Um, I'm not going to read. I'm going to read actually out of Luke here in a minute. But while you're in Matthew 24, uh, as Jesus is talking about the same event uh, in verse <clears throat> um, 20, talking about the destruction of Jerusalem here, but pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation such as, as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. And unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days shall be 
cut short. The worst that things ever were or would be. That's what Jesus is talking about with the destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70. Jesus is prophesying that this system is going to come to an end. There will not be a competing system with the promise that he made to Abraham with the new covenant system. Not going to happen. And the Lord's going to have his retribution. The Lord, you know, he, he showed patience. But he would have his retribution. Go over one more here to Luke chapter 19. The blood of the prophets cried out. Luke 19, 43 and 44. I'll pick it up in 41. And when he approached, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day even the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the day shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. They rejected the Messiah. And God was not going to allow a competing system. This is what we see in 70 AD. We know that Jesus said it was the worst of times. Um, uh, the historian Josephus records somewhere around 1.1 million people dead. It's interesting to me. I have to imagine this is hyperbole to some degree. But Josephus talks about the fires in the city being put out by the blood that was spilled. Jesus wasn't exaggerating when he said that it was the worst of time. So it's prophesied throughout the Old Testament. It's prophesied by Jesus. But how many people were really picking up on what was being communicated? You know, even the apostles, it took them a while to get it, didn't it? Well, as has been said before, the apostles were the best of the best. Go to Acts chapter 1. Acts 1, verse 6. Acts 1, 6. And so when they had come together, they were asking him, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? What are they thinking? Physical kingdom, right? Look, Jesus, um, even, even if it's just you and the 11 of us, um, if you're raising people from the dead, we should be pretty hard to beat. You know, like... Let's die. Let's, let's take it. Let's, let's take the kingdom. They tried to make him king by force before, right? Shouldn't be hard to get that stirred back up. You just make a couple public appearances. We won't even have to do anything. You're going to be king of Israel. Physical kingdom, right? Again, I don't want to be too hard on the apostles here. But you can see that they're still thinking physically. They're still coming from a very Jewish perspective. Even though the Old Testament prophecies are there, even though Jesus himself communicating, communicated that he was coming for the whole world and he anticipated the rejection by the Jews, it was still taking them. In Acts 2, we have the establishment of the true kingdom. The church starts with power. But even within that, what's the understanding like of the scope of the kingdom? By Acts chapter 10, I mean, okay, so in Acts 2, right, we have Peter, um, you know, repent, let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and for your children and for who? All who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to him, which we know is a specific reference to whom? The Gentiles, right? Um, did, he am did he have amnesia in Acts chapter 10? Right? You ever kind of read your Bible and be like, well, wait, 
Peter said, all those who are far off, and then in Acts chapter 10, you know, he's having to really be convinced to go talk to Cornelius, right? So again, how much is he processing? Which lets you know, too, were those Peter's words or were those the Holy Spirit's words? Because Peter is still working on the whole processing thing, right? We can identify with Peter sometimes, right? Our brains have to catch up with our mouths. And so it, all those who are far off, Acts chapter 10 comes along. Oh, we, and then we have to have the sign of the baptism with the Holy Spirit for the sake of who? The Jews, right? So that the Jews could know that the Gentiles were acceptable to God. Who can refuse the water? Because what? They had seen the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And Peter takes six guys with him to be able to testify that, hey, the same thing that happened, happened to them that happened to us apostles in the beginning. Just in the same way. Well, I guess God has spoken, huh? The Gentiles are coming in. So what scheme or plan of man was that? Or do we see the hand and the design of God in history? Was the plan of God throughout that really the Gentiles were, or excuse me, the Jews were a communication tool for us? For us to be able to understand. God's plan was always the Christian covenant. And he's using the Jews to help us understand our importance. For us to understand his power and his design. In Acts 15, of course, this comes to a point. Let's turn over there. At some point, I might get to my text this evening. <clears throat> this is all introduction. Acts 15, verse 7. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to test by placing upon the, the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they also are. The plan of God revealed to man, not because of any of man's religious schemes, but because God was bringing about a people. And that people was based upon faith. That people was not based upon ethnicity. And the plan all along was for the blessing of Abraham to be for all the people. And so that brings us to Romans chapters 9 through 11, which is my text. So you want to... You know, turn over and we'll reference some things in Romans uh, chapter 9 through 11. Now, obviously, um, there's a lot there. Um, and I do plan on letting Mr. Doty speak, uh, and I don't plan on getting thrown off stage. So we'll hit some highlights, okay? So uh, Romans uh, chapter 9, and uh, we're going to take a look at uh, verse 24 to start out. We'll pick it up in 23. And he did so in order that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. As he, also, as he says also in Hosea, I will call those who are not my people, my people. 
and her who is not beloved, beloved. And it shall be in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. The references, uh, if you want them for your notes for completion, are out of Hosea 1.10 and Hosea 2.23. Hosea 1.10 says, Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, You are not my people, it will be said to them, You are sons of the living God. This is one of the more obvious ones, guys. You are not my people. You shall be what? Sons of the living God. Because the plan of God had failed, or because the plan of God had succeeded. It was because the plan of God had succeeded. But again, it's, it's in the concealed part, right? But we've got Romans to see the revealed part. Hosea 2.23, I will sow her for myself in the land. I will also have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. And I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. The Gentile who is not beloved is now the beloved of God. The true sons of Israel are the sons of the living God, not by heritage, but by faith. And this is what God was always trying to get to. That's one of the things that I hope to inspire in you to help us to all think about is that we are living in the time that the Lord was looking to get to. That we're living in the Christian covenant and how blessed are we to be in it. Oftentimes people, especially early on, and I understand what they're saying, but often early on people will be like, it would have just been so, so awesome to be there in the days of Moses or to be there in the days of David or even Jesus' earthly ministry, right? But God's plan was to get to the church. The church is the plan all along throughout prophecy, and that is what we are participating in today. That's God's design, and we get to have a part in that design. God's plan all along executed in time was for his character to be known earlier on in Romans chapter 9 let's take a look starting in verse 1 Romans 9 starting in verse 1 I am telling the truth in Christ I am not lying my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart for I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. Whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God bless forever, amen." But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Neither are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. That is not the children of flesh who are children of God, but the children of promise are regarded as descendants. They are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. We're talking about a spiritual Israel, guys. It is the children of promise who God is concerned about. It's not about bloodline. Nobody ever received justification because of bloodline. Take a look at the point being made, verse, uh, being made in verse 7. Nor are they all children because they are descended from Abraham. I think that this has been brought out earlier that from a fleshly perspective, that they should start to, to draw some conclusions because what about Ishmael? What about Keturah's sons? Are they descendants according to the flesh? Is that what God was looking for? 
Or is it the descendants of promise? This is not about the flesh. It's not about Ishmael. It's not about Keturah's sons. It's not even about Isaac from that perspective. Isaac is a means to an end. Going all the way back to Moses' day, the Lord made known for his plan for bringing the Gentiles in. Why don't you turn to this one? Go to Deuteronomy 32, 21. Phil, I've been wondering how you used to say Deuteronomy. I might, it's been bugging me. Um, I might have to bribe one of your kids. I don't know. Um, do they know? Paula? <laughs> Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, verse 21. They have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. See, it's right there in prophecy from the Holy Spirit who wrote through men like Moses exactly what God's plan and design was always intended to be. No matter how much the Jews of that day missed it or how much religious people today try to twist it, it's still there in the scriptures. And they have to use, we have to use the New Testament's plain teaching to be able to go back not try to reverse engineer something from the Old Testament. Because it doesn't work that way. And if you try to work it that way, you're going to end up in the same cloud of confusion that all the denominationalists are in. But if you work from the clarity of the revealed scriptures, there's some pretty exciting stuff about being able to be in this time and in this place and being a participant in the design of God. That's exciting. That's something that we get to be a part of right now. God's plan was not just to bring in the Gentiles, but rather to eliminate the separation between Jew and Gentile. He was going to pour forth judgment on the Jews at the proper time. He was going to eliminate that Jewish system. Again, the temple, all of the records are destroyed in 70 AD by the hands of the Romans. Okay? You have uh, the sieges uh, the few years before that uh, culminating in ultimately um, the, the campaign of the Jews in 70 AD, right? You can kind of look back and read some of the history on that. And the Jewish system is effectively over. We have no records. We have no ability to be able to prove your heritage. You remember back the priests in the Old Testament. That's a problem, right? If you can't prove your heritage. So effectively, the Lord ends the Jewish system, which he was always intending to do. And he's doing that in time so that as we sit here, I, I'm standing, you're sitting, as we're here today, right, then there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. There is no, um, there is no ethnic separation. And what the Lord is looking for is those who are the Israel of faith. Go to Romans 9, and uh, we're going to take a look at verses 27 through 29. Romans 9, 27. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word upon the earth quickly, upon the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a posterity, uh, posterity, we would have become as Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. 
reference here is Isaiah 1.9. Notice that it's the remnant that will be saved. And simply, the remnant are those among the Jews who would accept the gospel message. They would accept the message of Christ. So the new covenant has come, right? And there were a number of Jews who would accept that gospel message by faith. Okay? And the remnant would trickle into the kingdom, which is what Romans uh, chapter 11, verses 17 through 29 is talking about. If you want to turn over to Romans 11 now, we're going to take a look just at the end of that, verses 25 through 27. Romans 11, 25 through 27. For I do not want you to be uninformed, do I, for I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And thus all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. All Israel will be saved. Which Israel is he talking about? It's not the physical Israel, right? That's not all Israel that will be saved. But there's going to be a partial hardening. Okay, It's going to happen to Israel between the beginning of the new covenant in 70 A.D., Okay? And then the fullness of the Gentiles will come in. Okay? And so what you're going to have is that there's no, no difference from 70 A.D. on between Jew and Gentile because what is the Lord looking for? Those who are the Israel of faith. Some guy used to say, who the Jew, you the Jew. I don't know who that guy might be. <laughs> oh, I didn't get that quite right. <laughs> who the Jew, you the Jew, Romans 2. Whatever. Um, <clears throat> you can only give them so much. Um, <clears throat> but, but what do you have? There, there's a partial hardening that happened. And then uh, in Paul's day to physical Israel so that at the right time, all of the physical Jews who were truth seekers might come in. That was the remnant that would be saved. However, as was prophesied, what were the Jews going to resemble? Save those who were faithful? Sodom and Gomorrah. How do you think the Jews of that day like to hear that? So what's the application? God's working on a, a grand scope. The Lord designs and the Lord executes His design. And he worked hard to show man who is looking, who is genuinely searching for God, that it is there and He has a transcendent design that goes beyond what anybody could conjure up. There's so many man-made religions. And what does the Lord communicate? He communicates that this came from Him because only He could have a design this intricate. Only He could have a design that would be brought forth through history in such a way so as the people who were even executing that design did not realize what they were doing. This is the Lord. And he shows his authorship of the scripture. Now, I think that that should leave us with a challenge because as we study the scriptures, we have a pretty good idea of what the Lord is doing, don't we? Are we motivated to work with him? Are we motivated to help execute his design? See, he's made us a part of a grand plan. He has made us a part of getting the gospel out. See, he wants a spiritual Israel, but what does he want? He wants us to go into the world. He wants us to go into that field. He wants us to sow that seed, that we get to be a part of the big grand design that God has and to engage in it. That's exciting. 
And that's what God was always trying to get to. The question really is, are we willing to work the Lord's plan? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As we begin to wrap up here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Starting in verse 18. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God's design was always to get to this point. Are we willing to engage in the process of reconciliation? Are we willing to engage in what God has given us to do, the commission and the work that he has for us? We can go with eyes wide open knowing that we have the backing of God and we can work wholeheartedly with him to get the job done, to help execute his design. That's exciting. And those are the things that as we go through the principles that were taught in the New Testament, we have the ability to be able to share those with new people, with people who haven't heard the gospel message of be reconciled to God, of God's great love for them and how they can have true biblical faith. That's the time that we live in. That is the blessing that each one of us have received, that we get this opportunity. The time has come. Now, one of the reasons why Leap the Dips is so frightening is because I'm not so sure about that design. That's why a 40-foot coaster can absolutely terrify me. Now, there's a number of other coasters that I've ridden, and they're quite a bit different. Some of them 200, 300 feet. But every minute detail in a coaster that's built today is prepared. Before... <clears throat> Anything is manufactured. The entire plan is put together, is designed, is animated, and is clear. So, whose watch is this, man? Can anybody else hear that? They wanted to make sure I got done on time. <laughs> Message received. <clears throat> so, Every single detail of that schematic is, is put together painstakingly, hour after hour after hour. And long before any of it is manufactured, you have a complete and total design that's put on computer animation, and they know exactly every inch, every centimeter of that roller coaster and they have their tolerances and they know exactly what's acceptable and they know what is not acceptable and then they want to get the public excited about it right so there's previews there's teasers there's trailers there's hints there's foreshadows until the ride is finally unveiled and then they come up with a lame name like top thrill too um <laughs> But all of these things so that people can be excited. And what's it look like? What is that design? Until finally the ride is revealed. And what they hope is all of its perfection. And then you get to jump on 
and be a part of it and write it. Well, God has left us some teasers, trailers, hints, previews, foreshadows throughout the Old Testament. And now we live in the time where we get to ride. Are you interested in riding?